Welcome to Rethink, the Financial Advisor Podcast. My name is Adam Holtz. And this is Derek Notman. We are your hosts, both veteran advisors and fintech CEOs who challenge the status quo, question everything, and have fun doing it. Hear honest commentary on the challenges facing advisors today. And be part of a community where we can all rethink the profession. Now on to our episode. Derek, what is your digital intimacy strategy? Ooh, <laughs> what kind of question is that? That's a little personal, isn't it? Well, what are you wearing digitally? Uh, <laughs> Dude, my camera's off. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is a podcast. You can it's wear whatever podcast. you want. That's a really interesting question. So, I mean, what is intimacy? It's connecting with other people on a more intimate level, a, a better human connection. But we have this whole thing called the digital world. So I guess if I think about it, my digital intimacy strategy is how am I conveying my human element, myself, over a digital medium mm. to connect with people better? That's a really good explanation. I, I tend to think of the word intimacy as excitement, but also vulnerability and excellent. Yes. And privacy, right? Yes. Uh, but Great also connection and um, maybe also unique, right? Not public. This is an interesting word. And it is, but it fits so well the more you say all those different words that. You're, you're better articulating it. Well, I'm just thinking out loud about this word that Jason Pereira dropped in an interview that we did with him. And it really struck home because we hear these conversations around human empathy, digital experiences, and he mashes this up and says digital intimacy. And it does, in a way, bring together these concepts of financial advice tends to be pretty intimate, right? Oh, no question. Uh, you know, I, I've joked before, advisors tend to know more about their client's situation than the, the priest, the doctor, and the attorney, right? You know, so, Even the spouse. Maybe, yeah, maybe the spouse even, even the times. Spouse. <laughs> so true, man. Sometimes they become the spouse. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. My, my financial partner, my financial sure. spouse. That is true. I, I think it's interesting because when we had this conversation with Jason, and many of you know Jason. We joke that he's the Kitsis of Canada, which I don't know if he <laughs> likes that one or not. But or is Kitsis some... the Pereira of the states? Oh, there you have it. So you got to play both sides. Oh. I love that. If you don't know Jason, he's actually an award-winning financial planner, portfolio manager, entrepreneur, lecturer, fintech expert, and of course, he's a podcaster too. And besides all of his degrees and all of his thousands of accreditations, right? He's also got the alphabet soup behind him. He's produced hundreds of articles and interviews. And he's a financial advisor, very much like us, at a company called Woodgate in Canada and also advises US clients and also advisors up there. So he's really well known and an industry advocate. And we actually had Jason, if you remember, on our podcast at the Wealth Stack. And he literally, in his two and a half minutes, he probably did six minutes of content. So when you listen to Jason, Notice how he frames his ideas around advice delivery today. And I think it's going to be really interesting. Anything else you want to add, Derek? No, I, th I think let's jump into it. He is he's really well-spoken, really insightful, and let's hear what he has to say. All right, cool. Jason, thanks a ton for joining us today. We really appreciate it. What is your unique perspective on what we call the financial advice market? My perspective, interesting term. I think the way I look at it is that I got one foot in either world right now. I spend a lot of time, I'm a practicing financial planner, but I also spend a lot of time in the advisor technology space. So to me, it's always about how do I bridge the gap and make these tools effective within my practice? And I think, you know, everybody uses technology as a necessity, but I think the, the big miss in all of this, in the application of technology across the board has largely been that we've been solving our own administrative problems. We have not been solving for better digital experience and engagement with clients to basically make their experience not just more pretty and interesting, but compelling and bring them into the conversation and use technology as a, as a means of getting them deeper engaged with us as opposed to just showing them, you know, here's a here's a PDF on a screen. Like that's that's unfortunately what was happening. We've gone from the world of paper where we sat down next to them with paper 
to PDFs on screens. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, no, we certainly can relate to that. And there's been an interesting <laughs> reticence to evolve to the consumer mindset, isn't it? I mean, it's interesting how advisors really tend to think of this is what financial planning delivery should be. Let me deliver it to you. Not what the customer prefers or what they want to side to catch up with that. They don't even ask. And what do you think well, about that? I think here's the thing. All the world is theater, right? Like to some degree it is, right? The most, think about the, the most memorable experiences you've had in your life. They've typically been something that's been thought out in terms of how you would engage with that environment, right? Now, it didn't make it insincere. And I think the problem is, is that everybody's in the mindset of, you know, they're coming to me for this expertise. So I'm going to dump expertise on them, right? This mm -hmm. is where the 200 page financial plan comes from. I'm going to hit you over the head with how smart I am. This is where the use of terms like alpha and, and beta come in. I'm going to hit you with how much I understand. Look, the true expert doesn't need to make things complicated. There's an old Mark Twain saying that I love. I wanted to write you a short letter, but I didn't have the time, so I wrote you a long one. Mm -hmm. Effective communication means that you have to think through how to be effective with as little use of, of resources as possible. Because here's the thing, people don't want to be overwhelmed. They want to be talked to on their level. So I think that that and all the negative things that we were, the less effective things we were doing offline have translated into the online space, right? And the reality is, is that a lot of technology we're, we're using is not used, not built to be put in front of clients, but more and more, a lot of it is. I mean, Adam, to your credit, Asset Map was, was one of the first. It's like, hey, this is a great tool to use within meetings for engagement. And the thing, and while we use those tools in our own, we don't stop and necessarily think about, hey, okay, this is great. I'm having a great consumer esque level experience myself. It would be really good. I can actually use this as a, in a dynamic way to actually engage with my, my clients. And I'll give you one like awesome example. There's this software that I used in Canada that was originally developed for lawyers to come up with wills and estate plans. And it's a visual drag and drop tool that basically helps me build up the estate plan by moving assets and people around and all this other stuff. And I found this thing. I'm like, okay, that's it. You need an advisor version of this. I need to be the first customer on it, right? And sure enough, basically I started implementing it. Without failure, it has a 100% rate of clients saying at some point, oh my God, this is so cool. Or wow, this is really neat. And I want you to think about that. I am being complimented about an experience, talking about their death. We're talking about what happens when they die and they are complimenting and, and engaged by the experience. So if I can make that compelling, I can make anything compelling. So the reality is what we should be doing is saying to ourselves, what are the steps? What are the reasons for meeting with clients? Right? How do I use the tools that I currently have, or maybe some of what's out there to not only just basically explain what's going on in very simple terms, that short letter instead of a long letter, not the 200 page plan, but the one page plan. How do I do that effectively without overwhelming them, but also as a means of having an interactive conversation to arrive at the solutions with them and build that relationship. And that's, what's been missing. Now, luckily there are a lot of vendors in the space now that are very much, you know, we've taken care of the needs, right? We've taken care of you know, the base needs, there's lots of tools out there for every basic need you have, but there's now more and more tools about how do we create deeper engagement? And I think it's, it definitely behooves a lot of advisors to start thinking through their practice about how they can basically utilize those tools in a live setting to basically, to, to just have better outcomes. I mean, that's digital engagement 2.0. I mean, to me, it's just basically not just worrying about using technology to make our lives easier. It's using technology to make our relationships better, right? Mm -hmm. And that, yeah. is, that is something that's been missing, right? And it's not about questionnaires. It's about every engagement we have. When you stop and think about it, right? Like major areas, financial planning, investment, insurance, tax, estate planning. If you look at the entire Kitsis map that exists, I can guarantee you can find at least one software out there where if you actually open it up in front of the client, you can have a compelling experience. You can have a conversation where you guide them through. And they can even lead some of it. So an example of one of the things I use with that I, one of the technologies I use, my portfolio management and reporting system, which is actually very nice, very clean, and very dynamic. And I will bring it up when I don't do statements anymore during meetings. I bring it up during a meeting and I open it up and I show them what's happened in their portfolio. I take them through about four or five different charts. And then I turn around and, and you know, if at any point they need to drive the conversation somewhere, Jason, what's in this account? Or did I fund this? Whatever. Click, click. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. There is yeah. no, I'll get back to you later, or, oh, let me look that up or call my assistant. It's instant it's, on instant, demand, right? Instant, yeah. instant engagement, instant engagement. Right. And this is the kind of experience that they want from a consumer standpoint when they are out there in the world consuming anything else. Right. Yes. Yet meanwhile, 
too often, I mean, just like just like advisor websites, look at how badly most advisors' websites work. And, and mine, mine needs an overhaul because I'll, I'll, I'll say this. Uh, my, my, my thinking has is, is evolved since I did this. Most advisor websites are designed to get clients or prospects to just be interested just enough so that they reach out to you for more information, okay? Mm -hmm. You don't have full details of your service offering, examples of your service offering, your fee schedules, all the you know, performance track records, all this stuff that the clients are, are going to ask about. They're going to ask about this, but it's, you know, it's never on the advisor website in most cases because we're just trying to get the phone call. Let me ask you something. What other purchase decision do you make in your life that you basically have to make a phone call to find out the information you need? More often uh -huh. than not, every other business, like think about Amazon, every purchase decision I make is basically made without talking to someone in most cases. Or if I had to talk to someone, I've already made the decision that I want to buy that thing. Mm -hmm. Yet we want to play this game of keep away with information, right? So this is in a lot of ways par for the course. We're not used to having these big open conversations in a digital realm, right? I mean, thank God we have Zoom and all these chat protocols now to do things virtually, but we're also underutilizing them, right? So a lot of people are like, oh, this is me using technology to relate to my clients. Well, it is. But if I'm bringing up the PDF or if I'm just jabbering on about a topic when I can bring up a tool to visually illustrate this, and we know that people are far more compelled and engaged with visual dynamic illustrations and presentations. You know, we could bring up reports. We could bring up slide decks. That's kind of an old school way of doing things. The new school way of doing things is that experience is baked into the software itself. Mm. It almost sounds like you're saying that some action steps advisors could be thinking or should be thinking about is one, what's your digital engagement experience for a consumer? Are you yeah. able to provide that instant engagement? Can they see in real time what you're both talking about, whether it's in person or Zoom or whatever, but then also give away your secret sauce, be transparent. But, but what, what secret sauce is there in this business? R reality, like there is nothing that can't be copied, right? You know, I think back to advisors back when I was a young advisor who would go up in conferences and give away all their best strategies. And people would ask, like, why are you doing this? It goes simple. You know, maybe 5% of you will listen. If all you listen, I couldn't no. do it. But 5% of you will listen, right? I'm making those guys better. The rest of you, you know, keep doing what you're doing. Knock yourself out. Oh, it's true. Money. And 1% will actually call you up and say, hey, can we do this together? Because I don't want to do my first to get on my own, right? Exactly. You have more confidence and experiences. I now know and it's actually exposure for you to share these ideas. And I'll go one step further to say, it's not just looking at it from a consumer standpoint, but imagine that consumer is your grandmother, right? It mm -hmm. should be something that gets across the point simply and effectively, but allows you to, at the same time, and where a lot of these softwares are very good at now, progressive disclosure, right? What's in front of you should be simple. You need to know more information. Click, I should be able to drill down. Yeah. I should be able to expand and I should be able to go down the rabbit hole in whatever direction the client wants to go, not what direction I want to go, whatever direction the mm -hmm. client wants to go along the way, right? So, so think of it again, the tip of the iceberg is enough for most of these people. Some of them want to see below the water, line, right? How far below the water line? Let them drive that part of the engagement. Well, Derek so, brought up some really que good <laughs> questions about action steps. What actions do you think that advisors need to start rethinking about? Well, first and foremost, you can't digitize or modernize a process that doesn't exist, right? So the question becomes is what is your process? That needs to be written down and mapped out. Okay. So. Do you have one meeting where you go over everything? Frankly, I hate that because it's just too much to take in. You know, in my own practice, we break up the financial planning cycle into separate meetings for each topic so that we can just focus on one thing. And the second piece is we know attention spans drop off like a rock after 10 minutes and are usually gone by 20. So can you effectively get through what you need to do in 10 to 20 minutes, right? Then it becomes, what is it you're trying to get across? And what is the simplest yet still value demonstrating version of what it is you're trying to do? Or what else are you trying to get across? Sometimes it's just giving them information. Like this is what your portfolio has done in terms of return. Other times it's a collaborative process, like working on some of the plans, planning softwares now allow you to collaborate on, on planning initiatives or whatever it might be. Others uh, like, like the estate planning one. So where are the points where maybe instead of coming to them with a completed, with a completed process, maybe I finalize it in front of them because their input matters. Mm -hmm. And that makes for a, a far more involved and engaged conversation but also one where they are brought into the process, right? And they feel that engagement. So, you know, back to your point on advice, what are your steps? What is it you're trying to get across? What are your tools that you're currently using? Do they actually help you in this process, right? And it's okay, if you don't have to have every step of your process fully digitally engaged, it'd be nice. Maybe there's not a software that kind of meets your needs for that. Great, put in, together a PowerPoint presentation, do something to, to add a visual to it. But 
if there's something there that isn't doing it, take a look at the marketplace, man. You guys are spoiled in the States. Like the amount of tech options you have is nuts compared to everywhere else in the world. It's a great point. I, it's funny because you mentioned this. I, I've been really on this, this shtick of talking about participation over presentation and the relationship or the yes. ratio of those two things has to dynamically change. We have been in a presentation mode for too long. And now people want to participate in, in working on building the cake together and telling you, oh, you know what, by the way, I'm allergic to nuts. Don't, oh, oh, there you go. Now I know this cake can be edible to you and your kids. And that's an important aspect of really just being part of the process that the retirement planning, the survivorship or protection planning, estate planning, et cetera, should have a participatory yeah. element. And I'll tell you one of the things that's going to help push us towards this is the trend in other technologies around artificial intelligence, right? So- mm -hmm. You know, there's, it's still early in the game with artificial intelligence. There's not a bunch of players that can point to and say, hey, this is the thing that's going to revolutionize financial advice and, 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 and whatnot. But there's AI being applied almost everywhere. In fact, most vendors are going to have some form of light version of AI within the next two years for sure. But there will be technologies that just basically make things faster and more effective, right? Now, nothing's going to save you 20 hours a week in terms of your time right now. But the reality is, is that all this stuff will compound and save you a bunch of time, which will lead to... An abundance of time, which is going to happen. What's going to happen with that? One of a couple of things. A, people are going to consume it and just not work as much. B, they're going to try to expand their client books, which if you do that, you still have the limitation of how many hours there are in a year and how much, how many relationships you can keep straight. So frankly, you do that, your service offer is probably going to drop, not increase despite the extra, the extra hours, or you're going to get deeper, right? And frankly, the advent of our artificial intelligence is going to make all the heavy lifting, hard work that we did on the technical side. Not push button, but pretty close to it in a lot of cases, right? So the future of this industry is one that moves more towards the human side, which is basically around the behavioral finance, behavioral therapy, the life coaching, the, the helping them self-actualize the best version of their lives. That's the future of this. You know, we've been talking, been talking about this a long time. A lot of the, the BFI experts have been talking about this for a long time. Well, the tech is caught up to the point where, guess what? The differentiator for people is going to be how deeply intimate you are with your clients and how much you truly understand. It already is, but now we're gonna be able to take that to 11. And frankly, the technology, the digital engagement piece is one of those tools that you use to build that level of digital intimacy in this case. You know, Adam, that was really fascinating to hear what Jason had to say. And I love how he ended there, digital intimacy. It's a great term, but that, really that's is. exactly what we're, we're moving towards. And it's, I don't know, you could have a lot of fun with that. <laughs> but what were some of your main takeaways? How did that all hit you? You know, it's interesting because Jason is so highly aligned with the space that you and I spend our days in, especially as fintech CEOs and recovering advisors and trying to build the next generation of tech before it's here, right? Try to be empathetic as to what's going to happen in the future and what our consumers and advisors are really going to deal with takes a lot of forecasting, but I think he's right, right? You know, the early comments that he made about digitization, that firms have said, okay, let me take my paper process and make it now digital, which basically means fillable PDF is, is just, it's so short of where we need to be. And <laughs> he's clearly evolved uh, in his thinking and he's on stages, as you and I know, beating the drum about engagement uh, and next generation of advice. So I, it, it's, it's pretty impressive how he codifies it all together. Yeah, it's it, you know it's funny. Wayne Gretzky was always about skate to where the puck is headed. And I don't know if Gretzky and Pereira are in this were from the same province, but they're both Canadians. <laughs> so I, well, we'll give them we'll give them some love there. But it right it's in so the same true, hemisphere. <laughs> One of the things though that really resonated with me just now is that. You you can't digitize or modernize a process that isn't documented, and it, it, this is so true. And I, I you know I was guilty of this for years myself as a brick and mortar advisor, cutting my teeth at insurance broker dealer. I didn't have really well defined processes other than like here's my cold calling script and let's go, mm -hmm. and that was it. And I, so I think that's true is that a, a lot of us fly by the seat of our pants initially because we're just drinking from a fire hose. Mm -hmm. So maybe taking a step back and actually writing some things down could be really, really helpful as you're starting to approach this whole digital intimacy thing that he's talking about with your practice, your clients, and so forth. Yeah. You know, you just made me think of something. You know, I, I have a doctor who I've had, a primary care physician. I've had him for, let's say, 20 years. He's probably 67, 
almost pushing 70 concierge practice. I went to one a bunch of years ago because I figured oh, I'm willing to pay a little bit more to get immediate demand concert. I, I, I see him once a year, like any, any physician. You walk into his office and his office literally looks like it's from the 1980s. Right? It has <laughs> not seen a bit of renovation. And I think it's because people are going because of the relationship and the history and the trust that we have with the doctor, even though we're paying him all this extra money, he's not investing a moment into your experience whatsoever. And I think a lot of advisors are living off the same laurels, right? They really haven't changed their process in years. People are accepting it. They're willing to pay their bills. You're a critical part in their life, or at least that's how they see you. And so they don't ask for more. They don't request more. And you're like, fine, why do I have to invest in an experience? Because they're happy, they pay their bills and we're doing great. And I think that's about to change. The kind of disruption that's happening, not just that the, the clients are going to change. And But remember what Eric McDermott said, right? We, we are tending to compete against our industry standard, which is really low in terms of client experience. But that is changing institutional experiences, right? The digital argument. When he said something about, how you don't know a product today where you have to like, oh, I want to go buy it and then I have to call somebody and I have to schedule some time, right? I, I want to learn about it. I might want to buy it right now without you even talking to me. So I think there's a change in buyer behavior. No question about it. It's a really interesting example about your doctor, mm. but I would agree. I bet you there's a lot of advisors that have that old, like they've had the conference table there that's been there for 30 years, same filing cabinets. The experience hasn't changed much. They've got great relationships, but the experience isn't changing. And to even just go back to our episode with Craig Martin at JD Power, mm. you can clearly see that there is a changing shift. The tide is changing on, on what the consumer wants from an experience standpoint, more so than ever before. So we have to be there some of the things I found interesting from what Jason was saying to it was that, yeah, they, they want this digital and engagement experience and they want it to be really well thought out. So it, so it feels just amazing, but they also don't want to be overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Talk to them on their level and think about what tech you're using. You know, he mentions about how visual tools are so helpful. They really get the client engaged so much more. And don't show a 400 page financial plan, show a one page plan, and then let them mm -hmm. drive the conversation, whether it's portfolio or plan or whatever. Like, okay, cool. I, I see I've got this IRA. Well, what, what am I invested in? All right, let's drill down a little more. Okay, well, what's that invested? Let's drill down a little bit more, but let them drive that instead of hitting our clients over the head with these massive reports or really complex jargon filled outputs mm. that they don't actually even want. Oh, that is true. Well, he said that, right? He said that the historical part is we used to have to dump our intelligence, our experience on top of their head in, in the form of 80 page reports. And, and that was how we built our credibility to say, this is so complicated. You need me, right? I, I know it's complicated. Let me show you how complicated it is. And we would show them what the recipe looked like. We were like bringing out the measuring cups and we're you know, I mean, who wants that? I was thinking when he was talking about this idea of advice engagement, which we've been talking about for some time, you actually called it digital engagement 2.0. I thought that's a really interesting thing. We could probably fit that into our advisor one, two, and 3.0 framework somehow. But I, I think the real interesting thing for me, and I've been obsessed about it for good over 10 years, is this idea of presentation relative to participation. And the, the key to what he was saying, and the, the first image I had in my head is when you go to, let's say, a sushi restaurant and you sit at the sushi bar, you get to actually watch them making it, right? You're, because you're participating in that, they're usually engaging with you, or maybe even if you haven't done that, the hibachi is another good example, oh. where the chef is exposed and you see the chef cooking. You, you actually are, you're getting the smells, you're seeing how they prep, you're seeing their cleanliness, you're you're seeing it come together and then you have this experience in the form of tasting it. And because you've seen it that come together, you, you can participate You can say, wait, hold, 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 I see, uh, do me a favor. Can you hold that sauce? I, I don't like that sauce. Like you can interject and basically create a customer experience. And I think what's happening is he said this, can we put the technology actually in the front with the client and start building this stuff with the client? Yeah. And I think that's a really important thing because now clients are seeing the value that you're bringing. You're guiding them through the maze, not just telling them, hey, make a left, make a right, make a left, left, right, right, left, left, right. An 80 page report and tell, and they're like, I, I, I need you to be with me. 
It makes me think of it's almost like going from the map quest. Remember when you used to print off your map quest directions? (laughs) (laughs) The turn by turn directions. Yeah. Yeah. That was it. it. (laughs) There's no deviation here. You have to do what this thing says, right? Otherwise you're going to be lost. And and now it's more like GPS where you can have alternate routes. You can choose if I want toll roads or not. It's more engaging. It's more visually appealing. Well, and recalculates, by the way, if you miss the turn or you decide to, hey, let's exactly. I like this road, right? That, yep. That's a really great point. And those are the institutional experiences that were brought up in our last podcast is we are actually being trained by tools and experiences we use every single day. And so are our customers to start expecting this empathy of my next experience I'm going to walk into. Have you already pre-thought of what my experience is going to be? So therefore, I know you're like an awesome advocate. I I tend to think of this just like a tour guide. If you've ever gone to another country and hired a tour guide, you know, you're driving along this road and eventually you're going to get hungry. But if the tour guide doesn't think, oh, I've already got lunch planned. Uh, I've already got it. We're going to this great restaurant. Like, fantastic. Now I, you're, you're actually proving your worth because that's going to be the biggest debate we have in the family is like, where should we go eat? (laughs) It always is. not how I want (laughs) to remember our vacation because we all know how stressful just figuring that out is. (laughs) Oh boy. That's funny. That's another great example. Well, there's definitely a shift going on here. I I love all of his points. Another thing that he mentions before we get on to like some tactical things advisors Mm -hmm. can do, I guess this might be a little tactical is don't try to hide what's going on. You know, he talks about advisors, websites, assuming certain things, and we're just trying to push everyone. We're going to give you a little information, but we're not going to tell you everything until you actually come and call us, email us, walk in the door. Like, why do that? Yeah. Don't do that. Just let it all out there and open and let the consumer drive it. We don't buy something on Amazon if all of the reviews are hidden. <laughs> or yeah, right. Whatever. Skip. <laughs> Next. Yeah, nope, not doing that one. So well, we that's think- interesting. No, but Derek, go there because I'm really curious what you think because you have a project that is actually trying to create this digital intimacy in Coupler. Now I'm, I'm thinking about this and most consumers today, when they know they want something, like they want financial advice, or they're anxious about, let's say, retirement planning or education funding, or the things that tend to be the catalyst for talking Mm -hmm. to a professional, my investment portfolio is a mess, or I've got too many accounts. They're searching, they're being digital sleuths, they're detectives are going out and they're trying to find a good fit for themselves. And what's the first thing they do, they just start going the same way they would shop for a, a microwave oven, right? Or some new shoes, they start looking for reviews, they start looking for validation. So how does an advisor actually take that knowledge and put that into function? Well, you have to know about it first, but then you have to embed in those places where people are already doing that and lean into it, actually. Don't compete with it. Uh, Because we we know that only about 20% of people that are searching for things at any given time are actually buyers. They're actually looking to make a decision at that point. So we have to be careful to nurture and coddle people and cultivate that potential relationship instead of just saying, oh, you're on my website looking at retirement rollovers. Well, you have to call me and we're going to do the rollover tomorrow. Whoa, 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 whoa. Like, hold on a second here. There's a relationship we have to build first. Yeah. And we have to really be thoughtful about that and letting the consumer drive that process. We are in a consumer driven world. And as soon as we give up control, the whole thing breaks down. Like think of the car buying experience, especially the used car lots. Like, and for any of you listening that have that background, I'm sorry, but it's a terrible experience for the most part because you go in and the second your foot's on the lot, you're swarmed with these salespeople and they're taking the control away from you. And then as a buyer, you just feel terrible. The whole thing doesn't feel good. So you Hmm. have to actually lean the other direction and let the consumer drive the relationship process, let them do their due diligence, give them as much information as possible. I could go on and on and on. I'm very passionate about this, but that's what we're trying to do at Coupler. But so that, okay. But so that's interesting though. I think you just touched on something curious. We all know that the buying the used car experience is, is such a thing to avoid that you probably, if you're a car buyer, you probably go to the same dealer you've always gone to, you re up on the same car you've gotten, or you've come up with a good buying process that allows you to be in control. As you said, look at companies like Carvana or uh, these, these, I don't know, eBay cars, or you can literally make this a true transaction where it doesn't get into that intimidated, uncomfortable yeah. environment people hate. And 
it gets you what you want today, right? That, that was an industry ripe for disruption. The financial industry is not that far behind, except for the fact that people fear that if I make the wrong decision without a human, I'm going to basically be skunked for the rest of my life. At least a car I can unwind, right? I can get out of the car. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, you've said so, this before. The cost of being wrong when it comes to my money is usually so great yeah. that I want, a, I want a human filter. I want a human advisor to guide me on this thing. Well, you almost overtrust the human's role because you're delegating almost the decision to someone else who has supposedly more credibility, which is why I think that we have such a, we'll call it community trust obligation to act in the best interest of consumers because the industry in general is overtrusted relative to the client's literacy, competency, knowledge. That's a good point. They're and, overwhelmed and yeah. they just, they, but, but so the, the key word there is trust. How do I find the right advisor that I can trust, that I know understands me so I can almost have a sigh of relief and give you this burden that's been on my shoulders and just hand it over knowing it's going to be taken care of? Yeah. And I think you're right. With the, the coupler you know, mantra and where you're going with it is, is help to get that alignment on multiple levels of interest, values, passions, geography, whatever it is that really is important to you will help deliver the trust experience, which will facilitate the whole business as a byproduct. And I, I think that's a really interesting take that you've made because you're really doing digital intimacy at a whole nother level at the prospecting stage. We totally are. And I, I joke to, to wrap this up, but if eHarmony and Bumble got married and had a kid, they would mm -hmm. name it Coupler. And there was finance involved. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's always money Not involved the other in relationships, stuff. so it's perfect. <laughs> okay. I don't know what kind of relationships you get from Bumble, <laughs> but I've heard that. I guess it's productive. I don't know. Very cool. It's, well, we love Bumble's. We stole a page out of their book. You'd have to check out our website to learn more. But yeah, they're, they've actually got a really interesting model. Um, Is that right? Yeah, one of the people, the founders of Tinder, didn't like how Tinder works, so left and started Bumble. Oh, is that what that is? No swiping. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think the last thing that he said that was really intriguing to me was this idea that there is no so secret sauce. And that is that is becoming, I think, a big eye-opener for a lot of advisors, right? They think their process is awesome, bulletproof, right? I think we need a wake-up call, uh, look in the mirror. And of course, some people, we know advisors, they're absolutely passionate about it. They're looking for Starbucks and Disney-like experiences, they're thinking, how do I contemplate what my advisors or my, my client needs are at all points of the entire journey? And they're obsessed about it. And I think they're obviously going to set the standards, but it's all getting commoditized, man. I mean, all the, even the technology, everything, everything in asset map, right? There's thousands of advisors using asset map, but still there's so many people underserved. The reality of it is that it's all about the advisor's application on top of these tech experiences, what we keep calling these human experiences that advisors need to pay attention to. Yep, totally. The human experience, the engagement, and then leaning into who the actual advisor is so they can have those human connection points where now the tech facilitates all the great things that have to happen. Awesome. All right, so let's talk about what you can actually do. Let's think about mentorship. Advisors listening out there, what are the four or five things that Jason said that we can go put into action? I like this first one. It's, and I think I might mention earlier, but it's so simple yet so powerful. You can't digitize or modernize a process that does not exist. If you don't have a marketing process or a sales process or a service process or whatever process you want to talk, if you don't have one, you're not going to modernize it. You can't just go buy a tech off the, off the shelf and assume it's going to solve it. So write down what your processes are if you have them. If you don't define them, I mean, heck, throw it on a yellow pad and then be like, okay, here's my process for this <clears throat> financial planning, data gathering, whatever. Now, what tech can I use to help modernize that experience? Fantastic. All right. So my second one was rethink your process in the actual advice delivery of getting the ideal focus down to 10 to 20 minutes. He said mm -hmm. that attention span drops after 20 minutes, especially if you go technical. So I usually tune you out after about a minute. So I, that's pretty good. <laughs> wait, I. I didn't know you were still on the podcast. When did you get here? <laughs> a squirrel ran by the window. I just, yeah. I, I think that's very true, right? So even our own audience here, if we don't keep it interesting, you're out mentally. So 10 yep. to 20 minutes of real focus, 
how can you get your real meaningful advice delivery down to 10 to 20 minutes of hardcore content that the client is involved in? The more they're involved, the longer that intention span will, will expand, especially it's interesting to them. It's about them. So yes. I think that's a real key. W look at your current strategy, right? If you have an hour long meeting, how much of that time is really just the critical content that needs to deliver experience, advice, education, and then of course, action. Uh, and that's what I would say is you have to be very intentional about where you're putting that in the meeting. You know, I, I'm just thinking about how I apply this in my own life with my practice currently is that most of my meetings mm -hmm. are half hour blocks on purpose. We, we force yeah. it to a half hour block. Now I'll always buffer a half hour afterwards in case it goes over, okay. but we can get to the meat of what we need to do in that 10 to 20 minutes that he's talking about. And then we have time if we want to talk about what they're doing and you know, what their kids are up to, the grandkids or hobbies, mm -hmm. like, great, we can get into all that. But the real focus, we're on there. And it actually works really well. We're in the past, we would, meetings would be two hours. Totally. Oh, well, yeah, if they're unbound, they're going to be unbound. I, that's Today, that's really hard to do unless you're- Really hard to we do. We have a schedule opening. Oh. Uh, I think that's a challenge. But I would tell you, I, we even have agendas, even if they're not spoken out loud. I usually tell people, I, I open every meeting with, how much time do you have for this discussion? doesn't yes. matter what it's scheduled for, because I, I want to know what their real attention span is. If they've got another big meeting coming or they got to pick up the kids and get in the car, I know I really only have 10 or 20. And that means we need to jump right into it. And, and I, I kind of setting that like a boss is really important to really drive the tour bus, not just like, hey, guys, where do you guys want to go? We're, we're in a country. They, we don't know anything. You drive the bus. And I think that's an important part of our role is to be a leader in that regard. It also builds confidence and trust and so forth. I think that's what else well, you, you know, got? Real quick to wrap that up, just comes okay. to mind is that sometimes we're so busy and overwhelmed with everything that's going on in our life that we view the advisor, the doctor, the tax professional, the tour guide, whatever, as almost a pressure relief valve. Like I am mm -hmm. relying on you to think about the things I just don't want to think about or have the time to think about. So make it easy for me to understand. And now where are we getting lunch? Right. You know, yeah. and then and just go from there. I, I, there's like yeah. this whole sense of calm that comes when you do that for your clients. And that's going to be important to do. That's a really, really awesome point. I'm glad you made it because it's true. We're in charge almost all the time of our environment or we try to be, <laughs> whether it's our kids, our businesses, whatever it is. But this is a great opportunity for me to, to not be driving. And yeah. I'm hiring somebody to drive the car. Get us to Let our me enjoy the tour. Let right. me enjoy. I don't want to think about anything. That's right. You know, just chill. Totally. I, that's a great point. That's really what we're paying for, isn't it? And that people will pay all day long for. There you go. Very cool. So what else you got? What was another takeaway in action we could take? I mentioned this before briefly, but just be transparent. Don't gate your website content or or whatever it is that you're marketing. Where like you're alluding to certain things or you're tempting people in, it almost feels like clickbait. Tell them everything. Mm. On our advisory website, we have our entire fee schedule out there. We have a video because we use Asimap. We have a video of Asimap. We're actually adding an Asimap PDF people can download to see a sample. Mm -hmm. And just give everything away. Here are all the ingredients and the outputs, but you still need the advisor to make it. You still need the cook. Yeah. So come to us when you're ready. And and so I think that we need to be very open with the ingredients. It's, it's like ingredients on when you buy anything at the grocery store. Tell me everything that's in there. Yeah. I'm no, all about to analogies today, man. I got all the that's, analogies I love it. today. I'm a super fan of analogies. Connect what you don't know to what you do know. Yes. And can you imagine a, a brand new box of cereal or whatever you're buying? And, and it says, yeah, call this in to find out what the ingredients are. <laughs> nope. You're going to put the it. box down. <laughs> you're going to go to the next <laughs> box. You're not even going to call. Right. Cause I'm trying to do my exploration. You're making it hard. Why are you yep. doing that? You're not an exotic item that we don't have to show our prices. Yeah. Because, right. Come on. You have to ask. You can't afford it. That is no longer the mantra of people. They feel like you're hiding something now and that's not necessary. Why, why hide? Why hide behind it? Buyers will come to you. I think the last thing for me was this AI comment he dropped in the end. And, you know, it, we've of course been fans of this. There's been a lot of talk about behavioral coaching. What is BFI or behavioral finance? Why is that relevant? Is it too intellectual a concept for our typical financial advisor who's trying to help people make good decisions for retirement? And then I'm going to manage their money or do their insurance, whatever. What does this behavioral stuff come into? And I think it's really forward thinking. A lot of advisors don't understand it, but it really is the future. And here's why. 
the artificial intelligence is very clear that it's going to free up a lot of time yep. to that busy work is taken up. It's going to allow us to go either really wide, that means serve more clients, or really deep, which means that's what I'm going to do with the extra time it's going to free up technology and AI and all this kind of stuff together. But really what matters is the behaviors that our clients have, right? When do they save? When do they budget? What decisions are they making day to day that's going to affect this whole outcome that none of our projections are going to matter, right? If if we give you a GPS from here to to drive from the East Coast to the West Coast- You mean Coast, a map quest? Say, Oh, sorry, MapQuest, you're right. <laughs> if we give them that and we tell them to drive 55 miles an hour and they're driving 30 when we're not Everything there with changes, them. changes, right? Yep. Right, they're pulling yep. over every stop to, you know, go to the bathroom. Like we haven't accounted for it. Like, so the problem is, is that we need to help people when they're not with us, when they're off the tour bus. Ooh, that's good. Doing? That's good. Uh, we're, we're always going to be late on this tour bus if I can't get them back on the bus. So so the key is, can we help clients make better behavioral decisions when we're not there? Because that actually will impact the outcome more than anything we do. And that's, I think, where we're going. I agree. And I, again, it's not replacing us. Skynet's not taking over. It's going to assist us yeah. and help us do more or, or go deeper, as you said. So I would lead into that. And chances are, at this point, there's probably something you're using that already has some AI in it that you don't even realize. Yeah. And if it doesn't have artificial intelligence, apply your advisor intelligence, right? Just exactly. that's the whole point. Empathy exactly. is really just about advisor intelligence. It's, it's, can I actually predict what's going to happen and give you contextual guidance on what to do now based upon that information? And that's really all we're talking about. We're going to free up the time to apply more of it. The question is, what are you doing with the time? Are you golfing more? Okay. You need life balance. Fine. Are you spending right. time with kids? Okay. What are you doing relative to the business? Because I'm telling you, other companies and technologies are thinking about how they're going to take that business from you right now. And I, that's the real key is don't rush, but definitely hurry, as Jim Rohn said. You know, just to wrap it up on AI, we've mm -hmm. got artificial intelligence, advisor intelligence. What about advisor intimacy? Ooh, AI, advisor I intimacy. I don't know. Maybe there might be something that might, that might be a little too uh, risque, but. Uh... I don't know. I like it. You got digital intimacy. Now you got advisor intimacy. I don't know what we're going to name this podcast. I don't know. Yeah, this is <laughs> this has been great chatting with Jason and just getting all this. We've really been able to have some fun here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, awesome. All right, my friend. Well, this was a great conversation. I hope everybody's going to think of one thing they can do from this podcast they can put into motion today or tomorrow if you're so inclined. With that, Derek, thank you as always. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jason. Make sure you go follow him and check out his own podcast as well. He's got some great content and I like his sense of humor. He's kind of right up there with us. <laughs> I agree anyway, with that. all right, dude, it was good seeing you, man. You too, brother. Thank you for listening to Rethink, the financial advisor podcast with Holt and Notman. Be sure to subscribe now and join the ongoing conversation. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Asset Map or Connector. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only.